Good evening. My name is Kitty Chong, and I'm the Senior Director of the University of Chicago Francis and Roshan campus here in Hong Kong. Our premier location in Asia, representing U Chicago values of free and open discourse, vigorous debate, and exchange of ideas. For those who have missed our event last week, we have launched a new series called Pop Asia, which will address events, trends, and cultural phenomena that originate in Asia and impact the rest of the world. Last week, we kicked off the mini series focused on non-fungible token arts or NFT arts with hundreds around the world joining NFT evangelist Tubador, Professor He Guo, and Professor Matthew Jesse Jackson. So for a super engaging and interesting session, which brought us lots of new inspirations, ideas, and thoughts on the way we look at art scenes in the new era. Tonight, it will be the second part of the NFT art series with Professor Randy Krosner hosting two special guests to explore how traditional and virtual art selling platforms are impacting the art world and changing the economy. And let me just quickly update the audience that we have a last minute change in the speaker lead. Lindsay Howard at Foundation is not able to join us tonight. Instead, we will have Matthew Ferret, producer of Nifty Gateway, a marketplace for digital art space in the West Coast joining us. Matthew is also a creator in the WIP Meetup. Before joining Nifty Gateway, he worked as a co-creator at Valuables by Sense and Samsung Biologics. The other guest, Noah Davis, is an associate vice president in the post-war and contemporary arts department of Christie's in New York, specializing in digital sales of both physical and NFT-based arts. Recently, Noah Spear had the historical cell of Beeple's every day, the first 5,000 days, establishing Christie's as the Vanguard traditional auction house for NFT offerings. Finally, I would like to introduce our moderator tonight, Professor Randy Krosner, Deputy Dean for Executive Programs and Norman Rao Bobbins, Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Professor Krosner, served as a governor of the Federal Reserve System from 2006 to 2009, and took a leading role in developing responses to the financial crisis and in undertaking new initiatives to improve consumer protection and disclosure. He was also a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, where he was involved in formulating policy on a wide range of issues. Currently, he chairs the Federal Reserve Advisory Committee to the U.S. Treasury's Office of Financial Research and is a member of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago's Academic Advisory Council. An avid art enthusiast and collector, he currently sits on the board of directors of the Renaissance Society. He is also a member of the Tate Museum's Photography Acquisition Committee in addition to the Arts Institution of Chicago's Committee on Photography and Media. He joins us today from Chicago Boobs London campus. So Randy, over to you now. Thank you so much, Kitty. I'm really excited to, to be here. Uh, this is a, a great program. Uh, I'm really, um, uh, really thrilled to be bringing my two passions together, uh, economics and, uh, and art, and, uh, and also a third passion, which is technology. Uh, when I was at the Federal Reserve, I, I left the Federal Reserve in, in uh, 2009. That's just when Bitcoin was uh, had been created, and so there was a lot of interest and um, uh, and confusion about it, and concerns and consternation over it. And um, and actually, what was what's been great is I've been teaching about uh, uh, teaching about uh, Bitcoin in my money and banking class ever since. And uh, and you know, I now have a number of colleagues who. Uh, teach about um, uh, these uh, digital innovations uh, in their classes, and even in the executive MBA program, we even uh, have uh, have some classes that uh, uh, some elective classes that focus on exactly this uh, this issue. So uh, hopefully, we'll consider coming to um, to get a degree with us at uh, the, uh, the campus in uh, in London, in uh, Hong Kong, or in uh, in Chicago. So. Now I'd like to turn to, uh, to, to Matthew. And uh, again, want to really thank Matthew for coming to, to this. Uh, he has a really valuable perspective because he has been an art collector in this, or a collector in this, this field for a long time, and has been one of the key innovators with Nifty Gateway. Because we'll also be hearing uh, later from, uh, from Noah Davis at one of the more established platforms. But, um, 
But Matthew, maybe you could tell us just a little bit about your um, how you got to be engaged in in these in uh, non fungible tokens um, uh, of these using the, the blockchain to really have a unique identifier for a particular piece of, of digital art, and then how that evolved into you um, getting to, uh, to Nifty Gateway and sort of what Nifty Gateway is doing. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the introduction, Randy. Um, so like Randy said, currently I'm a producer at Nifty Gateway. However, my entry into the NFT space started back in 2017, uh, like many people. CryptoKitties was my gateway there, but I'm also a co-creator of the blockchain-based uh, social networking site called Scent, which over the past maybe four or five months is probably better known for the experiment that we launched called Valuables, which lets people tokenize their tweets into NFTs. And it's the same service that Jack Dorsey used to sell his tweets for two point, his Genesis tweet for $2.9 million. Um, during my time at Scent, I was an active collector of crypto art, especially on platforms like Super Rare. Um, a lot of the early crypto artists in the space um, were users of Scent. And as the head of community, I interacted with them, recorded uh, over a hundred podcasts with the artists and just kind of like deep dived into that whole interesting uh, cultural rabbit hole in the crypto space. Um, so from Scent, uh, my transition into Nifty Gateway happened uh, at the top of the year, and I joined in as a producer. And the producer role is essentially working with the artists and the creators who are coming onto the Nifty Ga uh, Gateway platform who have scheduled drops, and working with these artists to shape and conceptualize the collections that they release. Um, so that's what I've been doing since January of this year. And obviously it's, it's one of the most exciting spaces uh, out there today. The, the type of creators and artists that we're bringing onto the platform uh, is, is a constant source of inspiration. The conversations about these collections, how to translate um, their ideas uh, into uh, art that is then tokenized and put to market, a, a global market is just absolutely the, the passion of my life. Could you give us maybe a concrete example? Because that will also help to explain exactly what tokenization means, what an NFT is, of mm -hmm. like what you do at Nifty Gateway of sort of like working with an artist or a creator and then getting it into this, uh, this NFT realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for folks that are unfamiliar with Nifty Gateway, we're an exclusive digital art marketplace. Uh, we utilize NFT technology to take digital art and make it easily purchasable, collectible, and tradable on the Nifty Gateway marketplace. So for example, this past weekend, we had um, the Beeple weekend. We were Beepled essentially from Friday to Sunday. Uh, we had a three-day collection with Beeple um, and he put together roughly a little under 10 pieces. And from Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we had various uh, sales where people all around the world could jump onto the Nifty Gateway marketplace. And for the individual works of art that people had put to market, they're able to either make bids or enter drawings for any of these works. As a producer, up until the actual drop, we're working with people to shape the collection. How many pieces to include? What is the, what drop mechanisms? should we release each of the pieces as like public auction, silent auction, limited edition drawings, et cetera. And we're going into conversations back and forth. If there's any technical challenges that need to be resolved for, for example, in Beeple's case, uh, we created a totally new uh, drop mechanism for him, what we're calling the loud auction. So <laughs> for his one of one pieces or for limited edition pieces that um, would have multiple uh, winners in the end of the auction, we created a leaderboard uh, style feature where the, for example, top 10 bidders at any given time would be visible. And if a new bidder would be higher than any one of those top 10 bidders, it would dynamically update in real time. So working with these artists to take their crazy ideas and conceptions uh, and make them an actual reality technically uh, so that our collector base can interact with them, uh, that's what we do for every single artist and every single artist's collection is a unique creation. And we try to provide the, the highest level of support and um, yeah, creative guidance 
to help achieve that collection and make sure that we have some happy collectors at the end of the, the drop. And then what is it that the collector is buying? What is this NFT? So an NFT is a, a digital token that can represent many different things. In the case of Nifty Gateway, um, we focus on the digital art aspect. So the token as a certificate of authenticity representing uh, the digital art that the artist has created, the collector is, is receiving this NFT that represents that art and serves as that certificate of authenticity of the art. Excellent. Uh, no, I want to tur turn to you because, uh, and this is a great combination of one of the most traditional platforms for uh, for uh, auctioning art or distributing uh, artist artist work, uh, which is Christie's and uh, and auction houses that uh, like yours that have been around forever, and then things like Nifty Gateway, which have in I guess in the crypto world have been around for a long time, but uh, but have only been around you know really counted in, in months and years rather than in decades and, and centuries. So Noah, how did you come to um, uh, NFTs, and then how did Christie's come to NFTs, and of course you know the uh, the the Beeple sale, and we had Troubadour on last week to talk about uh, his purchase of uh, of that. Uh, uh, that artwork oh two isn't in the i thought two was going to be here today well i was really looking forward to seeing him for the first time because like so many crypto people uh they, they don't turn their cameras on very frequently so i wanted to put a face to the the voice uh, uh you can watch the guy. video you can watch the video from last week we have a, i should uh, yeah 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 i got to um, yeah, I've worked really closely with two and, and with Meta to, to, to get ready for the bidding on, on, on Beeple, which was, I mean, just insane. How did I come to NFTs, uh, with, with quite a lot of, uh, confusion and amusement. That's, that's how I would put it. Um, until around January of this year, I had no idea what an NFT was. I knew that there had been a great uh, spate of sales at Nifty Gateway, kudos to you guys, um, in December uh, with Beeple. Um, and he walked away with something like three and a half million dollars. Um, anybody who works in contemporary art at auction who had their ears to the ground um, would have known that, that this was going to be uh, a thing uh, or very possibly could be a thing if, if, if uh, the stars aligned. And so when I was in the office, you know, we're hardly ever in the office or at the time we were hardly ever in the office in January of, uh, of this year um, to see a IRL painting. Um, I'm the head of, of online sales at, at, at uh, Christie's in New York for the contemporary department. So came into the office to see a painting we were selling, uh, a Kenny Shark painting we were selling uh, in our online auction. And one of uh, my brilliant colleagues, junior colleague, who's a cataloger in the department, um, saw me wandering around and flagged me down and said, hey, do you have any interest in, uh, in an NFT for your sale? Because I'm the online sales guy. So it just makes sense to come to me with the, the, the new fancy, shiny digital thing, the NFT thing. Uh, and I said, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm intrigued. I'd love to know more. Um, subsequently, we were introduced to uh, Maker's Place, who were our collaborators in the sale. Uh, they're another native digital exchange that, that has the same sort of business model as, as Nifty. Um, and Maker's introduced us to Mike, two people, who actually I just met in person finally uh, the night before last. We were hanging out until like three in the morning. He's a, an amazing human being, uh, just as I expected. Uh, hilarious and full of life <laughs> and very bizarre. So anyway, I digress. Uh, Maker's Place introduced us to Beeple. Beeple shared with us uh, his vision. Um, he presented what uh, was his, his, his first draft at, a, uh, at an NFT for us. Uh, and it was the 5,000th image uh, in his every day's project. So if you're familiar with, with, I'll give a really quick overview of what people does. Uh, he's been doing these every days, as he calls them, every day for the past now 14 years, but at the time it was 13 years. Um, so every single day of his life, and he's never missed a day, he somehow creates a unique digital drawing 
um, which now has has evolved, his practice has evolved to a very uh, uh, grotesque and over the top and fantastic uh, political commentary and 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 pop cultural critique. Um, for better or worse, I think of him as our honore domie, but he has a very American sensibility um, and a very louche aesthetic. Uh, his his uh, his stuff can be uh, not for the faint of heart sometimes. So this first draft that he presented to us was very much of that 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 kind of category. Uh, it was a an image of a nude Buzz Lightyear lactating and Kim Jong Un with breasts and all sorts of things that really don't work for the the Christie's brand. And so we said, this is great, Mike. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your uh, submission. Your mind is beautiful and crazy. Uh, could you think of something a little more brand appropriate for Christie's? He came back to us with his uh, monumental collage, the collage that we, that we ended up selling. And uh, it was in that moment when I saw this artwork that I really think I fully understood NFTs. And, and got really excited and, and realized that this was a masterpiece um, as far as NFTs go. Um, these are, this, this, this technology allows you to do things that just paintings and, and sculpture, the, the, the artwork that I specialize in, that was my bread and butter up until that moment, this NFT can do things that, that, that those works can't. Every single pixel in that collage amounts to its own fantasy world that you can, just zoom into and explore and, and live in. And that was, that was so powerful to me. Um, say what you will about the aesthetics and so much hay has been made about, you know, people's roots in this kind of edgelord 4chan, uh, not very politically correct uh, <laughs> sensibility, but it really, this, this, this NFT, the 5,000, the first 5,000 days represents people's transition as an artist from that that kind of cesspool of Americana to now a very lauded, celebrated, and populist with a capital P uh, political commentator. It's an American work of art, truly. Um, and that's that was my intro to NFTs and my, my sort of trial by fire. I have been uh, in the crucible. I think I still think I am in the crucible um, but, uh, you know, ever since that sale, um, every single day I've been speaking to tens of people in the, the crypto world, uh, but also, uh, people in the real world in, in every other cultural industry that exists in, in movies, in, in music, in, uh, special effects, in, uh, publishing, you know, designers, it, everyone wants to know how to make a brilliant NFT and bring it to market and make a splash just like people did. And this is because the technology is so revolutionary and it, 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 sure. it's just, it's, it's truly amazing. That's great. Yeah, and Matthew, I want to go back to, to you because uh, you obviously been uh, a pioneer here on, on, on actually both sides on the, uh, the collecting and the, the producing side. And um, we, we were very lucky to get a number of excellent questions in beforehand. I'm going to draw on some of those questions now, but feel free to continue to, uh, to send your, your questions in. I've already seen that some of the questions coming in are similar to the ones that, uh, that were, uh, were sent in before. So um, building on what, uh, what Noah was just saying, one of the questions was, well, how do we turn perhaps physical objects. So they could be a physical drawing or a, a ceramic piece uh, or something else. It could be a letter or um, you know, something else that is in the, the, the physical world. Can we turn that into a, an NFT? And then what's the relationship between the physical object and the, uh, the NFT? Yeah, so the intersection of physical items and the digital asset tokenized as an NFT. It's something that many folks have been exploring and tinkering with and trying to innovate. Um, if you have an existing physical item, I mean, you just need a, a digital rendering of that in some shape or form. It could be just a snapshot. It could be something more in depth that you can have in that digital form and then upload to uh, a minting uh, site or a marketplace where you can turn it into an NFT. And then you have the digital representation of that. Um, to give a clear example on, uh, for example, uh, uh, Nifty Gateway. 
yesterday we had an artist uh, with the collection, Rafik Anadol. Um, in the collection, uh, he put to market, I think something around 10 to 13 pieces. Uh, the piece, the, the NFT art that folks collected then has a redeemable physical component where the, the NFT is not just the art, but it also is sort of like an access ticket to claiming the physical component, which is a physical, like an infinite object, highly detailed frame of the digital work itself. Um, that's that's a, an example that's fairly common at this point. Folks are trying to uh, innovate at that intersection of the physical and have the NFT be, um, in a sense, callable from the, the, for example, a statue or a physical frame. A lot of people are using QR codes to accomplish this, but um, like RFID is another avenue uh, to, to have that in a little bit more cleaner uh, aesthetically and keep the, the art as the art without overlaying like a QR image. Um, but the most in interesting thing for me is not so much the marriage of physical and digital, it's what NFTs are kind of provisioning in the digital space um, culturally. I think this is a really underexplored avenue because if you think about the lived lives of most of us around the world today, it's largely in a screen, whether that's a conversation like this over Zoom or on Twitter or in a Discord or on your favorite website or in a virtual space. The, the lives we're living are digital, right? But if you look at the cultural history of these lived lives in the digital space, we're not really leaving a, a culture or history behind, we're leaving everything behind. And we have sites like um, the Wayback Machine that collect everything. But if you look back at human history, we have these uh, museums, we have these history books that have been filled with uh, the, the, the peak accomplishments of humanity and have been recorded, collected, curated over centuries and centuries and millennia, right? There's nothing of a similar nature in the digital space. But with NFTs at this point, what we're starting to see is this build out of digital culture and these digital artifacts as NFTs that are starting to accrue and people are starting to collect and curate and create virtual spaces dedicated to the peak of this culture that's happening and arising in what some are calling a metaverse renaissance. And I feel like that aspect of NFTs and the cultural significance is, is much more interesting fundamentally than trying to marry the, the physical with digital mm -hmm. NFTs. So uh, we just had a question that came in and I have, I have exactly this question. So exactly what is it that you own when you own the NFT? Because we know traditionally if there's a painting or even a digital photograph and that's on a you know some some sort of physical media you have that the artist may have said this is a unique piece or they may sign it on the bottom this is one of five so you know what you have but what is it is it just lines of code what are you getting with the nft so again like every nft obviously is its own unique thing and depending on the creator whether that's an artist or just a technician on the background what is actually being conferred or created or promised differs right if you have an artist that says i'm only putting out this work it's going to be a one of one like that artistic intent is something that we should assume would be honored and that would be the only image associated with that particular nft token and the collector will get this nft token that they can own and transfer and sell and buy on their own and the token itself um, most of the time, again, not always, but because all NFTs are not the same, but if I collect a work of, of digital art as an NFT, that NFT will contain a URI pointer that will point to some image hosting site, whether that's a decentralized system like an IPFS or uh, an Rweave, or if it's like an Amazon web hosting service or something like that. And that's where the image uh, will have been uploaded to. Uh, usually by the artist, but sometimes uh, on the like marketplaces that that deal with the technical component on behalf of the artist. Um, and with that NFT, mo most of the time marketplaces uh, that specialize in digital art won't confer any special um, copyright status. The, the owner will be able to um, show it uh, and like um, publicly display it and things like that, but no commercial rights typically are conferred. Uh, obviously, different marketplaces, different artists um, operate in different ways, and we're seeing more interesting 
uh, experiments at that intersection of commercial IP being conferred uh, via NFT transfer. Um, but yeah, for the most part, when it comes to digital art, that's the typical lay of the land. There are experiments on the generative art side of things. Um, projects like artblocks.io are specializing in what, what's called on-chain NFTs, where not just the, the token lives on chain and is recorded on the blockchain, um, but the associated metadata, including the, uh, the kernel, the algorithm that generates the, the artwork that is associated with that the particular NFT lives on chain and is recorded as well. So that as long as, for example, the Ethereum blockchain is around, that art can be called up on any computer at any given time, regardless of what happens to, for example, AWS or any of these other file hosting mm -hmm. uh, uh, programs or platforms. So no, this obviously is, is a very important issue for, for your traditional customers who are used to getting the piece of art and putting it on their wall or donating it to a museum with their, their name on it. So um, our, our, um, I'm interested to know about both the new people that have been brought in to, um, uh, to Christie's who are interested in these uh, in NFTs, as well as how are you convincing or what are the questions that uh, traditional collectors have about NFTs, sort of along the line of what, what Matthew was talking about? Well, so uh, I found that, that most uh, crypto folks, crypto art collectors, they don't care about exhibiting their work. They, they really are, are mostly interested in seeing it in their wallet. That's, that's, that's all they care about. They know that anybody else can click into their wallet and see it too. There are a number of startups right now who are at this like a very bewildering number of startups who are trying to make uh, dynamic frames for, for NFTs, which are basically LCD mm -hmm. screens or, you know, LCD screens plus where you can connect via Bluetooth and throw your NFT on the wall. But that seems to me like it's a, a, a really secondary kind of concern. This, this artwork already exists and presents itself in your mind's eye, which is kind of the cool thing about it, right? You have to conceptualize it. You have to think about it to make it exist, which is different than a, than a painting. Um, it, it's, it's a really fascinating dynamic. Uh, our existing clients who, who ask us this question, you know, but how do you exhibit it? Uh, the, the artists, for the most part, are very, very loose on their, on their definitions of, of how these things can be displayed, which is a very refreshing departure from the attitude of most contemporary artists who are extraordinarily controlling over every aspect of how their, their work is presented um, and this is just not the case with crypto people. For example, people, um, when we were asking him what we could tell folks when they asked about uh, how to display the work, which actually that question came way more frequently from journalists than it did from, from clients. Um, he was like, I don't know, project it on the side of a building, print it on the sails of your yacht, put it on aluminum panels, uh, do whatever. He really doesn't care. Um, as long as it's, a, he would use the term epic. He just wants it to be epic and over the top and, 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 and fun. So uh, crypto guys just want to have fun. Um, that, that's, that's the way they're, they're looking at it. I don't see it as a necessary thing. Um, you know, the, 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 der, like the derogatory term for the real world with these people is the meat space, right? So they are, they're, they're very unconcerned with how their art lives in the meat space for the most part. Yeah, that's- uh, Randy, said, I can interject real quick. Sure. There's a little bit more nuance there, I believe. Um, especially a lot of new collectors like Noah was talking about aren't really thinking about the display of these objects, but folks that have been in the space and collecting a little bit longer definitely think about where they want to display. And that's where you're starting to see the emergence of some of these blockchain-based virtual spaces arise. Um, even Tubudor and Medikovin, uh, who collected the $60 million, $69 million everyday piece, right? Before that, um, after they had collected the, the 20 people every day is on Nifty Gateway, they took that art and they created three virtual museums in Somnium Space, Decentraland, and Crypto Voxels, 
and, mm -hmm. and displayed each of those 20 pieces in each of those museums across those worlds, right? And they yeah, also- but importantly, not in the real world. That's, that's, the, that's what I mean. It's all happening in the metaverse. Yeah, but it's 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 beyond like the wallet that you were talking about earlier, which for earlier collectors, that's that is enough. But as you are in the space a little bit longer, the display and and, and how you are kind of uh, curating the art that you have, uh, or uh, at least the subsection of it, becomes more primary uh, concern at this point. So I just wanted to add that color to what Noah was saying. Yeah, no, I think that's it's very very interesting because. The um, you I think you have very different people at least at this point coming in using these uh, you know who, who are our collectors very different type of people who are creating the art because I know from my uh, engagement with artists you know what Noah said is is correct I mean artists typically are extremely. Uh, concerned about how their art will be displayed, whether it's at the Renaissance Society at University of Chicago or at the, the Tate Modern or at the Art Institute of Chicago, sometimes like down to the millimeter of where it is. And this is now a very different world, but in some sense, they might be able to create that same level of control by creating a, a museum or a, uh, a place where they, uh, uh, where they have these. So it's extremely, uh, extremely interesting. We've had a couple of questions come in about uh, the, um, uh, authentication process and uh, the stability of these things. And Matthew, you mentioned that um, you know it'll uh, uh, it, it'll have the, this NFT will be there as long as the Ethereum blockchain is there. And so that raises a, a few questions. Of one, it, what happens if there's some issue in maintaining the uh, the blockchain? Because we certainly have seen some um, blockchains like uh, Frac. Uh, fractionalized like Bitcoin and then um, then you have Bitcoin cash and some some other other things so the blockchains go in different directions second is it possible that um, there'd be a new blockchain that would be created and another nft could be created on that blockchain so you could have two of the uh, uh, of the same thing sort of how do you ensure the authentication the ownership sort of you know so it's a series of some some of the, the the more technical questions as well the bigger picture questions authentic uh, authenticity and, and ownership yeah and to be clear like nfts don't only live on the ethereum blockchain right um before ethereum I think an early proto example of nfts would probably be called like rare pepe they lived on the counterparty um network which is associated with bitcoin today a lot of artists are tokenizing nfts on the Tezos blockchain, um, H-E-N, here and now, I'm not gonna pronounce the Latinate <laughs> of that new project that's popped up, has become very popular with a lot of artists. Um, people have been tokenizing on Polkadot, Kasama, um, on, obviously on Matic, a, a layer two solution to Ethereum, um, and the Wax, we can go on and on. There's multiple sure. examples of, of blockchains, right? Um, if any one of those blockchains goes down or if Ethereum goes down, um, that's a multi-billion dollar problem <laughs> and yeah. there's far bigger concerns than like what's happened to the art at that point um, but because of the, the underlying market caps if you will of the blockchains that is what is leading a lot of collectors more or less to have a fair degree of certainty that what they are collecting will be around for a fairly long time hopefully hopefully forever right um, in terms of the authenticity or kind of hoping that if something is tokenized on one, if we're talking about art specifically, if some an artist has created a, a one of one uh, work of art on Ethereum, the, I, the hope would be that as long as Ethereum is around, that artist would not then go to any of the other competing blockchains and mint the same thing. That would be obviously no bueno, and we don't want that situation. So there's an, a degree of education with the artists about being a little bit careful and circumspect with what they're tokenizing. Uh, in terms of the authentication of an artist tokenizing something, this is a really interesting problem um, that I don't think we have like a definitive solution for. We have two current practices at the moment. We have marketplaces like a super rare or uh, a known origin maker's place where the artists themselves are uploading and minting the art themselves, which entails them to take an Ethereum wallet and use that to sign a minting transaction, which some people like to think of that, that signing as like a digital signature because the 
uh, Ethereum address that the artist owns is unique to them and no one else has access to that but themselves in theory, right? So that digital signature is one route to verify the authenticity of the actual art itself. Um, but then platforms like Nifty Gateway or Foundation, uh, where we are minting on behalf of the artists, we make very, very sure in the metadata that the artist themselves is indicated in the title and the art and the smart contract that we create bespoke for the artists. So that it's it's more human readable than, for example, a hexadecimal address that an artist is using to sign on some of these other sites. But I feel like heading forward, there's going to be a better, more like understandable and more permanent process uh, by which we're able to authenticate these assets. And I know there's a number of startups that are out there working on such solutions, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. And so a question come in about pricing. And so Noah, so how in the world, you know, in, in the traditional uh, art world, you Christie's would often put an estimate on, uh, on, on a piece of art. And my guess is this is more challenging in this new world, but we had a couple of questions come in about, um, you know, how is, how is a market price determined here? And, uh, you know, you guys auction them off. Have there been re-auctions? Have there been other secondary market transactions for people to, uh, to understand these? And, you know, in, in the traditional world, uh, there's a primary market, which is um, the artists sell through galleries, and then things may come to the, um, the auction houses. Here, it seems to be different. It seems that the, the traditional galleries are being disintermediated because they often were the ones who were the price setters. So how do you, you know, who's setting the price and how are prices being set when that intermediary is no longer there? Very good question. It's almost like the middlemen are disappearing. Um, how interesting, right? Uh, yeah, so for, for Beeple, we, uh, we necessarily published a, a, a very strange estimate and it was a non-estimate. Um, uh, this was actually the very first thing that I had to clear with legal. Of course, I had to clear a million things with legal sure. uh, to make the sale happen from you know selling artwork that technically doesn't exist to accepting cryptocurrency and vetting all of these new bidders. It, it was, it was uh, not a nightmare, but it was, it was Kafka-esque in the most bureaucratic kind of way. Um, but the first thing that I cleared with, with legal uh, was being able to publish estimate unknown. So for the people sale, we didn't really have an estimate. The estimate was literally unknown. We published that on the website. It said estimate unknown. This is a winking, kind of uh, play on this other term that we use sometimes called estimate on request. So mm -hmm. at auction houses, there's always a low estimate and a high estimate, uh, or there's estimate on request. And we only ever roll out estimate on request when it's a super prestigious object or artwork that we know is going to uh, command an enormous price point. It's, it's like, it's a signal, like this is very expensive, right? So right now we have a, a Basquiat skull in our, in our evening sale, which is estimate on request and rightly so, because it's one of only three Basquiat skulls and the last one sold for more than a hundred million dollars. And this is the last one on the marketplace. So that's estimate on request. Um, but yes, for people, we did estimate unknown. We opened the bidding at a hundred bucks and within eight minutes, we were above a million dollars. We had a hundred plus bids from 30 plus bidders in seven different countries. And here's the really amazing fact, only three of those bidders were previously known to us. So completely brand new audience. So yeah, how do you, how do you price these things? You, you don't, you don't, you literally, where it's not, it's no longer our job to do that with this kind of asset. There will be instances where there is, you know, as this, as this marketplace develops and we, we, uh, we exit the toddler stage of, of NFTs as collectibles. Because right now, basically what, what this, this, this collecting community is, is just like one giant toddler that sprung up and is sprinting across the living room. It's my job to make sure this, this thing doesn't fall over and you know smash into the corner of the, of the couch or onto the glass table or whatever. I have to make sure that this sprint turns into a jog and then turns into a very healthy stroll for a very long time. So to do that, yeah, we're being very strategic and careful about how we estimate things. Um, there will be more estimate unknowns, I'm sure, as we, as we continue to sell NFTs. But 
That being said, right now, our very next NFTs that we're selling uh, are the CryptoPunks in our evening sale next week. So we have nine CryptoPunks uh, coming from the founders of the, the, the project, the creators of the project. You could call them artists, but I, I think they would wince at that. They really consider themselves technologists first, artists second. So the CryptoPunks is a really interesting project. They were minted in 2017. Uh, there are 10,000 of them. They're created by an algorithm. Um, they're non-fungible in the sense that not any none, none of these punks are exactly alike, but they share similar attributes. Um, and because of this, there is a very organic and natural hierarchy of, of collectability that's established itself. The punks with rarer attributes are more collectible and hence more valuable. And this marketplace has gone from, you know, essentially these punks are worthless. Literally when they were when they were released onto the Ethereum blockchain, if you had a MetaMask wallet that was connected to Ethereum, you could pluck any punk you wanted and put it in your wallet and own it for nothing. So all of these punks were claimed, then they were traded, um, and all of this is being conducted over the blockchain. So uh, if you go to Larva Lab's website, you can see in real time how much people are paying for every punk. You can see who owns what. You can see who bought what. You can see even offers that were rejected. So for the punks, we can set an estimate. We, we have the whole index. Imagine if there was a website for Pablo Picasso where you could see in real time the prices that were being paid and the deals that were being negotiated for every authentic artwork that Pablo Picasso ever created. It would completely change the prices uh, necessarily for, for, for all of his work, all of his work. Um, so with the punks, you already have that. So our estimate is seven to $9 million. And that's very easy math. And it's very easy to check our work because you can go to the Larva Labs website and you can see that, yes, several aliens have sold for more than $7 million. And, and this group is one alien and eight very rare human punks. So seven to nine is actually sure. conservative. So that that's a very unique instance where we have all of this data and we're able to put an exact estimate on it. But for other artists, um, it's going to be a little bit more tricky. Um, and this is, I this think is there really, will be more estimates unknown. Yeah, this is really an amazing transformation because the art market, one of the things that really strikes me is its, it's opacity. Uh, so little is known. I mean, there are a few things that do, you know, are auctioned at some of the major auction houses and there'll be public uh, public prices associated with it. But so many of the, the transactions are, are take, take place behind the veil that you don't really see what they are. It's the, you know, the dealers who are, are intermediating those and, uh, and people don't, don't really know. So this is just a radical step forward in transparency in yeah. the in the art market. Um, but one of the, the concerns, of, a few questions have come up on this, and I'm gonna put two questions together. One of the concerns is, well, is this just kind of a bubble? Is it just kind of a fad? And so where do you th see things going in three to five years? I mean, Noah, you had talked about, you wanna make sure that the child doesn't crash into the table. So that's kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah, weird at three to five years. But I'm gonna to go to, to, to Matthew first. So how do you respond to people who say, well, this is just kind of a fad, a, a bubble, as many people have, have um, raised these concerns about crypto assets in general. And then where do you see things evolving in like the next year, three years, five years? Yeah, so again, like this is a space that didn't pop up yesterday. Uh, folks have been creating and building not just art, um, but at the intersection of, of virtual spaces, fashion, uh, collectibles, gaming in this space for years. Right. And they've been building through what people are calling like the previous crypto winner. So after the, the early 2018 crash in the uh, crypto market, up until essentially uh, the, the end of 2020, regardless of what the market price has been, this is a space that has been innovating quickly. More just amazing talent, amazing creators have been flooding into the space. So because of that, surplus uh, and continuing uh, entrance of, of, of new talent, both on the technical front, on the creative side, and then the collector base and just the users, uh, regardless of what happens with this current hype cycle, which is something that we are definitely in at the moment, you can see it in all the headlines and the fact that we were featured, right, the NFT space is featured in like SNL and programs like that, right? There's no doubt this is a hype cycle. Um, but again, the hype cycle serves a purpose and long-term, the fact that 
the awareness and understanding roughly of what digital collectibles are, digital art can be, how NFTs in a sense uh, are facilitating that, that understanding is a great boon for the industry and something that is immensely helpful such that when there isn't the inevitable cool down, which I mean, you can already see early signs uh, depending on the project or creator or whatever, um, heading forward, folks will continue to build and innovate and create interesting and compelling projects and work that will continually uh, interest folks. And the big distinction between what's happening in the NFT space and what happened and has happened previously in the cryptocurrency spheres is that in NFTs, every individual artist or every individual project is a market in and of itself versus a cryptocurrency, which is all encompassing and the price of ETH falls, uh, that's the end of the story. With NFTs, you can have uh, multiple creators of projects that are on the ascendancy versus other projects that are maybe kind of stalling or stagnating, right? So there's a, a buoyancy that is created by the innovators, by the creators, by the users that are intrinsically motivated to continue participating and creating the space. And that is what is really exciting about this. And it's not limited to a particular, particular geographic jurisdiction. This is a worldwide phenomenon. And you're seeing people and ideas and creators from places that we haven't heard from, or most people have not had the uh, opportunity to interact with coming online in the art space, but also in these other creative verticals. And, and that's, that's something that has me very, very optimistic heading forward, not just three to five years, but 30, 50 years and beyond that. Um, that was the first question. What was the, the follow-up there? Uh, well, no, I think that I think you covered uh, covered that. I also wanted to get uh, Noah's Noah's view on where the market is evolving to, and and also we've had a number of questions come in. If someone's interested in getting into this realm and they haven't been in it before, how do they uh, how do they get in? Um, how do they become a bidder? How do they become um, more knowledgeable about these these things? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. So the first question was about this bubble. Uh, I, I don't think that we even have enough uh data points to to categorize this as a bubble right now it's a total anomaly it's it's a it's it's something that we've never really experienced before um so we don't especially at, from my perspective as christie's really we have people we have mad dog jones at phillips and we have the pock sale at nifty gateway with a sotheby's bumper sticker on it and these are not enough data points for us to categorize this thing as a as a bubble, um, what it is, I think I think you know Matthew's terminology a, a, a hype phase is definitely applicable. I would I, I like that uh, distinction, um, but this uh, whole uh, media speculation about the bubble and how it's bursting is very fantastic. Um, and uh, and fabulous, I think, in in the in the negative sense. Uh, there's a lot of spin there because it's it's attention grabbing and and it's, it makes a good headline. Um, but I actually think that this 70% dip in the tradability of of NFTs that was that was recently being bandied about and and, and got a lot of news uh, is a good thing. It, we really need this this correction um, because frankly. And this is what I, I, I believe strongly. This is the, the, the greatest threat to NFTs as a durable asset is an abundance of supply. There are way too many terrible NFTs on the marketplace right now. It's just a fact. There are, people are buying NFTs that are going to be worthless very, very shortly. And this is an opinion that's shared by a lot of people in the space. You know, Gary V has been especially vocal about this. Beeple and Lady Phoenix and I, when we were hanging out last the other night, where this was the the one of the main topics of discussion, um, and we're we're really concerned about that. So my uh, greatest responsibility is to be a good steward of this marketplace and not a gatekeeper. Like I really don't consider myself a gatekeeper. I want I want artists to feel empowered and to make great art. But if I'm bringing it out for sale, I want to, I want to know that it, is, that it is going to hold its value and that it's going to be a durable, um, you know, uh, uh, staying thing. Um, and to do that, the, the, the bar is very high for us. 
we're going to make an announcement probably in the day or the days following uh, the the evening sale where we're selling the punks um, about our next big NFTs that we're going to be selling. And I believe that they are truly top of the line. They're they're the uh, they're top notch. They're the best. They're the best NFTs that 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 I know we could possibly be selling. Um, and there's going to be a ton of fanfare around that. Um, and then going forward in, in July and in the fall, we have programming that will absolutely blow people away. Um, the fall, especially there's going to be a multimedia project, um, that is in my opinion, uh, probably going to command the same price, uh, or even more, uh, as people. Um, so we're doing everything that we can, you know, from our, from our vantage point as, you know, the, the top of the food chain to triage and prioritize only the greatest opportunities and to be really, really methodical and deliberate about this rather than just cranking things out because we can and, we, and because we know that people are going to buy things right now. We're not doing that. And this is, again, a, a really, really important point for us. Um, curation, highly, highly curated. Um, very, very carefully orchestrated sales. Um, also, we're refining our own uh, technology to be really authentically in this space too. I don't think we're going to have our own marketplace to maintain in the very near future, but I can tell you that we're we're minting our own tokens in, on the you know test net, not to the main net, but we have a smart contract and we 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 know how to do this. So. Um, very exciting to be um, where we are uh, in the kind of eye of the hurricane. Um, but in order to uh, you know, keep the toddler from falling over, as I mentioned, which is basically allowing this to become a bubble and then burst, in order to do that, we're just bringing the right material to market. And we're, we're going to ensure that we only have slam dunks. Okay, great. Um, oh, oh, and for people to get to, for people to get knowledgeable and interested about about uh, about uh, NFTs, check out the curated sale that's coming up. We're going to have a, an NFT sale announced. Um, there's there's two announcements coming after the evening sale, but we will be selling a much more diverse uh, series or, or collection, if you will, of crypto artists, but also artists from the contemporary world who are dipping their toes into NFTs. Um, you know, there there very well may be a representative from the fashion world and from the music world in this sale. It's going to be a dynamic, uh, multidisciplinary uh, event, and I think will be very educational for people who don't have a sense of what makes a great NFT because there's so much noise out there. And uh, this the sale that we're bringing to market, it's it's going to be pretty important. And so I um, had a couple of questions around how is this technology going to change not just the art market, but art itself of what's considered collectible, what's considered art, who are considered artists. And so Matthew, um, especially since you were sort of uh, early on in this, how do you um, how do you think about that? How this technology is going to actually change what people perceive as as art and or as as a collectible, and what do you think the impact is is going to be of that on the production of you know, what what are traditionally called artists, but maybe they'll be called creators or something else going forward? Um, well, it's hard to to judge what people will perceive to be art, but what the what NFTs broadly are unlocking uh, are these latent artists, as I like to think of them, uh, folks who have been creative but may have been put off by the traditional art world, um, by galleries, by um, working in that sort of very well entrenched uh, space that has its own very strict uh, buttoned up norms and expectations and things like that. And now the fact that artists don't need to, to do all that legwork um, in the traditional sense, and they can simply log into a marketplace and, and upload their work and mint it, but we're going to see an explosion of creative energy. We're, we're already seeing that in the very, very early days, but still it's like less than 0.001% of creators are really doing anything in this space, even today. 
um, many, many years after the NFT technology was enabled, right? So we're gonna see this explosion, but uh, I think Noah was talking about this, the, the role of the curator, right? The role of, of gallery, the digital galleries and collectors um, really focusing on what is the best of the art that is being created and the best projects and collectibles for that matter, that's going to become increasingly important because I mean, just as everyone's familiar with today and the, the internet, when they log in, there is so much content that's put out there. If everything is tokenized and recorded, like for example, the Wayback Machine that I mentioned earlier, like everything's lost essentially the day after it's been created and logged, right? So the role that the curator, um, and collectors and, and artists for that matter, who are also uh, increasingly becoming prominent collectors in their own right, is going to become something that's very, very important to help kind of shape and direct the direction at which public perception calls things art or high art or starts to kind of segment uh, this, this NFT art space that's, that's obviously in the, the emergent stage right now, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think that does. And no, I want to go to you with this question, but would also, also another piece of a question that, that came in is that, well, let's say this does take off. Does that mean that people will be less interested in the Pablo Picassos and the traditional art world? And so those values might plummet? No, definitely not. I don't think so. I mean, the way I look at it is uh, for now and, and probably forever, uh, but maybe not. Who knows? I have no crystal ball. But I, I look at, at NFTs as a spice. They are, they are a spice. The main course, the, the dish is still in real life art. That's why there's only one NFT in our evening sale next week. Um, will there be a day where there's two or three NFTs in the evening sale? Yeah, sure. Will there be a day where there's only NFTs in the evening sale? I don't think so. Not in my lifetime, at least. Um, so... I, I don't think it's a threat. Uh, also, we have we have data points now, it, 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 and we only have very few data points um, that 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 prove that there are crypto collectors, you know, collectors who bought NFTs previously, who are now moving into the physical world. Justin Sun, who was our underbidder on uh, the Beeple lot, um, just bought a Warhol self-portrait and a Pablo Picasso to the tune of 20 plus million in our London evening sales. So there is this, this idea that they are, that they are, you know, exclusionary, that, that, that the one sandbox exists and the other sandbox exists. That's a fallacy. And we're already building that bridge between the two. After the Beeple sale, I can't tell you how many major collectors, major collecting dynasties were knocking on our door and calling our, our heads of department and our executives saying, how the hell do I get into this? Um, but that doesn't mean that that's all they're gonna be interested in going forward. This, this narrative, this, this kind of knee jerk reaction that, oh my God, it's so new and it's gonna destroy everything. That's, that's a red herring to me. Um, I think people should be more concerned about the, the underlying technology. NFTs as an asset, that's only one, that's only one facet of this, of this technology that I find so fascinating. The blockchain, what it does, we're talking a little bit about uh, democratizing and, and opacity and that kind of stuff. Blockchain gets rid of that. And it also is a fantastic mechanism for recording information. So what I see is maybe not NFTs replacing IRL art, but the blockchain technology stepping in and democratizing the art world and making information uh, much more accessible. You know, the, our, our job at the auction house, when we prepare for any of our sales, the majority of the work is, is with the catalogers who are, who are doing amazing amounts of research. They're here until three in the morning, cracking open old dusty books and going to the library and writing artist estates and foundations. And every estate and foundation has its own set of rules and protocols and politics. If you have a blockchain in there that's recording all of this information and solving for authenticity testing and keeping track of exhibition history and keeping track of literature refer references and all of that in perpetuity, it just streamlines the entire business. So that's how I really see Mm -hmm. NFTs and blockchain and crypto uh, uh, disrupting the art world in the long term. In the short term, NFTs as art, for sure. 
for sure. But in the long term, it's going to be more of a technological. I know we've kind of we've come to the end of our time, but I wanted to make sure to to give Matthew an opportunity to respond on this. We've got a zillion more questions, so I know some of you may, may have to uh, hop off. If you guys can hang around for a few more minutes, I'll try one or two more of them. I mean, we've got uh, I had 20 questions before this started. We've got another 30 questions here. We'll never get through all of them, but maybe one or two more. But Matthew, did you want to comment on what uh, or, uh, what uh, what Noah was saying? Because you I, I think you might have a slightly different perspective. Oh, no, I just wanted to say that I loved what Noah was saying right there. Oh, okay, and great. To add, add on top of it a little bit of color, um, I feel like what NFTs are enabling is the appreciation of more art, right? And I, I think it's really important to kind of point out that if, for, for folks that think that you only love digital art or physical art, I, I feel like that's a fallacy. And that's Undercut, undercutting all the respective artists out there in the world right. today and then the future artists, right? So what NFTs are enabling is just a wider variety, more access to appreciate great, beautiful art and the artists that are creating them. Whether you're in front of a physical canvas creating something or in front of a computer screen, artists are creating, right? And I feel like this is a beautiful, just fact that more people should acknowledge and be excited about. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything that Noah said earlier, I don't need to reiterate that. That was, was great. Um, good, good. Yeah, actually, um, from the, uh, the discussion last week with Tubador, the variation on it that he had, because I think he's very much on the same page, is that it's sort of, it's allowing um, creators, because he, he wanted to use a broader term uh, rather than artist creators, to create things that will be collectible. And so allow the creators to be able to sustain themselves, to be able to get uh, resources in, to, uh, to be able to create. And you know, whether it's formally considered art or not art, or you know, whether it's songs or something else that's, uh, that's, uh, that's being put up there, it's, it, it's sort of a new marketplace where I, I see I'm kind of putting my economic uh, terms into, into what he said, a new marketplace that's allowing a wide variety of creators to be able to connect with people who might like it, who otherwise might have had almost no chance to connect with those, uh, those, uh, those people. And so sort of widening people's engagement with, with uh, creative uh, issues. Um, a question that's uh, come up or a concern that's come up and, and it was both in the, uh, the questions I got in advance and, uh, and the live questions was that one of, uh, there's been a, a concern raised that digital art and minting NFTs is, is using a lot of energy and so is not very climate friendly. Uh, could you respond to that? Yes. Yeah, sure. oh. <laughs> do I, do Matthew, you, you wanna go first? You go first, yeah, I, have, sure. I have a very, yeah. uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, first of all, I mean, the media has, has really done a disservice and blowing this sort of argument out of proportion. For the, there, there's not a lot of data, reliable data out there that's been conducted um, in a scientific manner to, in manner to really verify the veracity of these claims. I think everyone can agree that proof of work blockchains do consume a lot of energy. That's mm -hmm. one thing that's for certain, right? Where this energy is coming from for all these miners that are supporting these blockchains, that's something that really does need to be studied further to really, really see like what percentage is coming from renewables versus coal, et cetera, right? That's one part of it. When it comes to NFTs and the blockchain, you can think of the blockchain as a public infrastructure, not unlike the metro or subway in New York City, right? Where whether you, if you live in New York City, you riding a subway on any given day doesn't impact whether that subway runs. It's running regardless. With the minting of NFTs on blockchains, it's the same way. You're a rider on a subway. Either you're minting today or not. And the fact that you don't mint doesn't impact your energy uses. If you do mint, it doesn't impact it, right? You're, the block is getting filled regardless. But if you want to look at overall transactions, less than 3% on the Ethereum blockchain of transactions are uh, become uh, from NFT minting or sales or anything like that. So like those are facts that it's about perception. It's how you're framing the argument. And it's, there's a lot of nuance, which like these discussions are erupting usually on Twitter, which is not very good for nuance. <laughs> um, but there's a lot, I mean, for a marketplace like Nifty Gateway, we're, even though we're not contributing a lot, we're doing carbon offsets. That's one thing. Like with the Beeple auction we had previously, it was something like six or $7 million that were raised 
to purchase these carbon offsets. And we're updating our infrastructure to become ultimately 99% more efficient at minting, right? Which should be cheaper and efficient in many ways. But again, the end of the day, NFTs aren't materially impacting the volume of transactions and the blockchain itself acts as its public infrastructure, irrespective of who is minting or not minting. Yep. Uh, very well said, Matthew. Um, so I've been, I've been fascinated by the way that this, uh, that this whole uh, spin has, has developed and I have some theories about where it's coming from. Um, but look, yes, th th there is an environmental impact of, of crypto technology. And like Matthew said, we need to address that, but we need to uh, assess that before we address that so that we can figure out how to properly address it. Um, there, there's been a, again, a kind of clickbait uh, sort of narrative here, I believe. If you're listening to this, uh, watching this, this, this uh, webinar, whatever you want to call it right now, and you enjoy a cheeseburger every once in a while, or you drive a car, or you buy clothes, you're doing a lot more damage to the environment than buying an NFT, like a, like a lot. So also people seem to forget the fact that Christie's and Sotheby's and Phillips and every art collector in the world are sending art around the planets in jets like all day long, every day. So in jets and on, and on uh, trucks that are just driving around with art inside 24-7. Um, so this narrative that, that somehow crypto is going to destroy the planet is really, really, really misguided. And I think coming from voices that want to um, delegitimize the technology, who feel threatened, frankly, by blockchain, um, and for the reasons that, that we've just been discussing, because this, what it does, blockchain is, if, it's, if it is fully absorbed into all of the creative industries that exist, they're all going to have to completely revolutionize their business model and they don't want to do that. So one way that you can delegitimize NFTs and more, more importantly, blockchain, because this is another thing that, that you have to understand. When the media says NFTs, they're really talking about blockchain. They're really talking about crypto. They're talking about this new technology that is going to be even more disruptive than the internet ultimately. And this is an easy way to pull the rug out from underneath it and to stop the momentum. There is a there is a there are people out to to really destroy the momentum that we have, um, and I think that a lot of people are are taking the bait and and spinning this out of control. I, of course, again, let me clarify: sure. there is a very real environmental impact of blockchain technology that we need to address, and I. In speaking with the minds that are working on, on these problems and thinking about these problems, I have so much confidence in their ability to solve this stuff. We are iterating so fast and improving on technology at an exponential rate right now. We used to you know, have a fax machine, right? We might look at, at, at paper money and, and coins, physical coins, the same way we did th th think about the fax machine. Like it could be, it could sure. be the next fax machine. Sure. And so when that, when that dynamic is at play, when you're talking about paradigm shifts, real true paradigm shifts, being concerned about the, the environmental effects, if this allows us to get away from so many of the other nasty activities we engage in and start to think differently about the way we treat our planet, this is, uh, I think, uh, gonna solve itself all right i'm gonna ask two more questions one is going to be one of these skeptical ones so that you guys will have an opportunity to respond to it. and then one's going to be the, the kind of uh, big picture what's uh, what's next and so um a number of questions have come up about the potential for hacking i know there have been some articles about the people work was hacked and, and no, then wait, wait, can i just can I, I have to jump in and stop you because that I know, I, I'm, is, I'm saying that the report no i want i, I want you to be able to to respond Respond to okay, it. so let's Almost. define. Okay, hack, a hack, right? People, people say hack, and they think somebody oh is like cracked into the system and broken in and stolen it. What that guy did, and his name is Mister Person, is 
<laughs> mint against a uh, smart contract. It's called sleep minting. He sleep minted into Beeple's wallet. He created basically a convincing fake of Beeple's work. And then he went and sold it for, for tens of ETH. He's basically stealing. And when, when he did this, uh, of course, Artnet jumped in and wrote a headline about how people hacked, you know, people got hacked and the technology is broken and all this. It's t a total sham. It's a lie. So I, no, that's why I, I want to give you the opportunity. Sorry. No, that's why, no, that's why, because a number of questions came up about this. I want to give you the opportunity to res respond on that. Yeah, it's a joke. It, the, the, guy is, the guy is trying to be, uh, you know, Banksy-esque provocateur and he understands how the technology works but he clearly does not understand what an nft does in terms of proof of proof of authorship and the you know the chain itself tracking the movement of these tokens yes there's a convincing fake out there kudos dude you made a very very convincing fake and you tricked in somebody into paying a lot of money for it maybe they bought it because they wanted to be a part of this burgeoning history of crypto art but the people who know how this stuff works know that that's just straight up a lie and that that specifically that uh headline on artnet that gray market piece that they ran about how people was hacked was shameful fake journalism good now i wanted to give you an opportunity to respond matthew i want to get to get your view on this and also one of the questions came in about well, what if, you know, we, we, there's a lot of talk about uh, the potential for quantum computing to kind of blow up traditional cryptography and traditional protections. And so you've got both, you know, the, the current issues uh, like uh, Noah was just talking about, but also the potential going forward for that kind of innovation technology, maybe to, to change the, um, the ability for these smart contracts to be as smart as they are, or the, the, the you know, cryptographic uh, protections to, to, to be there. Do you think that's a concern or is that not a concern? Um, well, first to echo no on what he was talking about with uh, the just shameful reporting on what that people fake represented. That plus one to that total BS. We should not use that H word to describe that nothing was was hacked, right? Obviously, yeah. It's just hack journalism is all. <laughs> Boom, mic drop right there. Love it. Um, when it comes to the quantum computing question, I, I try to respond to this right now. Again, it's similar to like, well, if the Ethereum blockchain goes down, like there's a whole lot more problems that folks are going to be worried about uh, than the collectibles and things like that. Uh, you, with quantum computing, I have no idea, no insight into that space, but things don't happen in a bubble. It's not just that uh, certain folks are innovating quantum computing and they're going to crack all the, the SHA hashing and the traditional encryption measures that have been adopted and employed up until this point, like encryption hashing will continue to innovate and all the other sectors that are quote unquote potentially at risk of quantum computing hacks, they're going to be developing measures to prevent and defend against that and again, like that will, the knowledge will be dispersed as it needs to be. So it can continue to protect the infrastructure and the systems that we've continually relied upon. Is it a risk? Probably. But again, uh, folks will be innovating in kind of uh, lockstep with potential malicious actors who could potentially use this new technology for nefarious means, right? All right. And so one final positive question, but uh, unfortunately, since we're so far over, I'm going to limit each of you to just one minute each. What's the greatest opportunity going forward with the NFTs? Oh, man. What's the... Well, I think it's uh, the greatest opportunity is for artists to make brilliant work. I think there are a couple of artists who are already thinking about what they can do with smart contracts that, that is dynamic and innovative and unlocks experiences, time-based NFTs, generative art, all of these things are amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking to various artist studios who, when they you know, finally realize these very complicated and dynamic projects, people are gonna lose their minds. Mad Dog Jones's replicator at, at Phillips was an amazing example of just how dynamic uh, and new uh, these, these, these contracts can be. So I think uh, the greatest opportunity is for artists to create groundbreaking revolutionary artwork and to ensure that they get paid for it because the resale royalties of, the, of these smart contracts, which we haven't talked about at all, but it's a major, major deal that artists now can make money off of 
people profiteering from selling and flipping their artwork. So I think yeah, all so of that's great. Yeah, next week's um, uh, uh, part uh, installment in this series is with the artists, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of focus on uh, on that. So Matthew, just quickly, what's the greatest opportunity going forward? Oh, yeah, the op just the opportunity to innovate in this space is, is breathtaking if you really take the time to consider it. I mean, NFTs as a canvas that are part of the broader fabric of this digital internet, like how can you, how many different ways can you utilize that new technology? Um, and the fact that we have artists like Noah said that are getting paid now and will continue to get paid in theory in perpetuity for the work that they're putting out there is just going to empower them to create even more magnificent art and ideas and bring in, especially the collaboration intersection, I think is really interesting. And you're starting to see this explosion of artists collaborating and all the collaborators being on an equal footing when it comes to the, the selling and production and all of that and collectors being right there along the way. So again, Noah really nailed it. Just the innovation and creative potential. Um, is the most interesting and exciting part about this whole space to me as well. Great. This is really thrilling for me. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your, your thoughts, both you know, your kind of personal journeys here your, and uh, your um, interactions in this, uh, this, uh, this area. You know, as someone who's, who's interested in you know, innovation in and uh, crypto, because of my time at the Fed, uh, interested in, in art and in economics, this is just fascinating because it, it really is potentially completely disrupting the way this very large market operates and it potentially creating a lot of new opportunities, obviously a lot of challenges and potential for bubbles and people to make money and lose money. Um, but you know that's how new markets often develop. They can be very risky, very volatile at first. And then uh, the, uh, to use Noah's analogy, the baby grows up and uh, yes. a, a little, uh, little less volatile. But it, it sometimes we can be re pretty rough along the way. We all know we've had We've either been teenagers or have had teenagers. At home. Right, yeah. I'm waiting for, for NFTs. I'm waiting for the terrible twos, as they say. We're not even, we're way too soon to be talking about teenage years, but, this, but so, I feel like they're going to be teething shortly. Great. So, um, uh, well, I'm uh, eager for, for more. I'm looking forward to the, uh, the next installment of the series. If you haven't seen it, go back and uh, take a look at uh, Tubador's um, um, contributions in the first part. Oh, yeah, I think for sure. Super, well, yeah. super, super interesting. Not, not only for you guys, but I, I think for, for the audience, super interesting to get his insights. And also what's really impressive is, you know, we've been over 15, 20 minutes and most of the audience has stayed with us. So that shows the, the interest and excitement in this. So I, I turn it back to you, Kitty. Thank Thank you so much. Thank also to Mark Barnico, uh, who uh, uh, helped to, uh, well, who really kind of conceptualized this and put this together. Uh, really exciting. And I look forward to uh, uh, maybe coming back in five years and seeing, uh, uh, seeing how the, uh, the child has grown. Matthew, Noah, Randy, thank you so much for sharing your insight about this new market dynamics particularly on the seller side. It is such a privilege for us to have experts from London, from New York and the Silicon Valley, especially at such an early hour, Matthew, to exchange views tonight. So I'm sure there's a lot of food for thoughts for our audience to take away. So in our next episode, we have invited an award-winning contemporary Chinese musician and the first to release a music NFT, Han Jun Tan, the co-creator of Dada and a pioneer in NFT arch, Judy Mam, and also, renowned digital artist and U Chicago professor, Jason Sullivan. They will share their works and discuss the realities of NFT and arts. So please join us next Thursday, 8.30 p.m. Hong Kong time to hear the creator's point of view on this revolution of the art world. Thank you everyone from around the world for joining us in Hong Kong. Good night and stay safe.